Hello there and welcome. If you remember, in an earlier video I was discussing my Rot und Schwarz Vector Network Analyzer and Sine Wave Generator that I got really cheap off of eBay. And in that video I mentioned that Rot und Schwarz actually designed a special controller for this uh, setup back in uh, the late 70s. Uh, but I also mentioned that I would be developing my own GPIB bus interface so that I could connect this setup to my standard laptop up here. However, I have received something really, really rare and uh, I'm going to show you uh, right now what it is. And here we have it. This is the Rode und Schwarz process controller. It's also uh, named the Puck. And basically it's an advanced version of the Commodore PET. I read somewhere online that the Rode und Schwarz Puck is in fact a Commodore PET, but that's not true. This is developed specifically by Rode und Schwarz and it's a lot more advanced and a lot more expensive than the Commodore PET was. This one is fully working and it's programmable in BASIC. I'll show that to you later. Okay, and if we look inside we'll see that there's a lot more stuff going on here than in the Commodore PET. Uh, so just based on that you will know that it's a completely different beast. We have uh, the CRT of course, which I need to be careful not to touch because this machine has been on quite recently. And next to that there's a metal box, kind of, with uh, the two floppy drives. These floppy drives are different than uh, the PC 5 and a quarter inch floppy drives, although they work on the same principle. And they still use the small hole in the disk for indexing, but they are actually completely different. The digital uh, format of the data coming out of it, completely different from the IBM PC floppy drives. These are a lot earlier. Okay, apart from the CRT and the floppy disks, we have the power supply over here. There's a massive input filter and there's a toroid transformer in a, encapsulated in the metal enclosure down here. And over here we have a PCB standing up and this is all the rectifier diodes and the, the big power transistors and stuff like that is mounted to this. And that's the entire power supply. You can see the quality is really strong. This is 2mm aluminium and uh, everything branches out from there. Later on I will remove the floppy drives and we can take a look at the main board. But basically the circuit is quite similar to the Commodore PET. The 6502 is hiding down here. And uh, this is the A version, it's running at 2 MHz, which is twice the clock rate of the original Commodore PET. On the left side of the main board we have all the video generation circuit. And on the right here we have all the RAM and all the ROM. And uh, what is really special about this is that it has uh, some slots, really professional quality uh, electronics where you can plug in additional hardware. This one here has a uh, hardware for floppy disk controller, obviously, and there's a plug-in card for high resolution graphics. So that uh, you can draw Smith charts and uh, stuff like that on screen directly which is really really cool. Down here there's a lot of EEPROMs and stuff and uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later. But uh, I'll just remove the floppy drives first and uh, then we have a better view of the main board. So uh, just give me a second and uh, I'll be back. Okay and uh, now we're looking back uh, from the front and this is where the floppy drives used to be. When I got this it was really really dirty inside. And it's been a home with a smoker, definitely. There are some sticky black stuff everywhere inside here. And uh, although I've tried to clean it up, it's still not really good yet. But it's still working. And sometime in the future, I should remove the main board and clean that up properly. But anyway, if you look at the assembly of the enclosure here, the floppy drive here just slides right out, just loosening a couple of screws and it slides right out. And the same with the main board. No, you can't see that, but the main board is mounted to some aluminium guides and you just loosen a couple of screws and the main board pops out. Um, the only problem I have with that is that uh, I might not be able to put back the connectors in the right location afterwards. But anyway, if we take a look at it uh, on the main board, which is uh, right now the interesting bit. As I said earlier, on the left here, just behind the CRT, we have all the video generating circuit. This PCB or this computer does not have a specific graphics chip. 
is using TTL gates to generate the video. And down here where I dare not touch, there is an EEPROM with uh, all the characters, all the bitmaps for all the different letters. I'll just get the keyboard and uh, I hope it will focus. If you look at the keyboard, I think you can see it. It has all the letters, uh, it's a normal QWERTY keyboard, although the numbers are out here on the left only. On top of every letter there's a shift for a little graphics uh, character and this is right out of a Commodore's VIC-20 keyboard. It's very very similar, except for the quality of the buttons obviously. Uh, these are professional uh, buttons, uh, probably made by Cherry I guess. But otherwise the layout of the keyboard is very Commodore. So you can see the heritage. If we continue looking at the PCB, in the center here we have the main CPU, which is the only kind of custom chip in this entire design. Unlike the Commodore PET, there are very few specific chips used here. It's not used the entire Mustang chipset. It's using those parts that uh, Ode und Schwarz found useful. Uh, okay, anyway, we have the main CPU circuit here. And then we have here two rows of uh, RAM and uh, there's 32k bytes of RAM in this machine. One chip here is 2k, so a lot of RAM for a machine of that age. And I bet it was really expensive when it was new. And then on the left here, well that is the right to you. What we have is ROM and down here there are some MOSTEC chips. Uh, the 6522, there are a couple of those and they are for the GPIB bus and general I.O. There's also a Centronics printer port at the back here and there's an option for a serial port which is not included in what I have. And underneath all these cables to the to the riser card there is another major chip yeah, which is a 6520. Um, I'll have to look that up. I'm not quite sure what it is, but it must be some kind of I.O. as well. So let's just put that back and then we'll take a look at the riser card. Uh, which is actually more interesting than the kind of standard main board that we have down here. If you look at the PCB itself, it's a two-layer PCB and it's a... Uh, it's the biggest size you can basically make in a single batch. Uh, but it is two layer board and it has all the data lines going crisscross. And uh, then they have these metal guides here, or I'm not sure what you should call it. But these are for the power supply. Um, these are positive supply and then the ground is on the main board. And uh, that was not too unusual back in the, the early 70s. And they basically guarantee that high current can run through here without any problems. Don't forget that all the TTL gates are using a massive amount of power. If they're using maybe 10 milliamps each, and there's a, I don't know how many are there, 50 here. That's already half an amp just for the logic. Then there's the CPU and the RAM and the ROM and so forth. Uh, plus the power for the floppy drives and stuff. So it really uses a lot of power. So these uh, power rails here are uh, very well made, very well designed. Okay, and I've now flipped it up so that the main board is standing up right here. And uh, the daughter card is uh, down here. Anyway, what we have here is data and address buses coming in through here. The board has one or two interesting things. Uh, first of all, it has some slots here for plugging in additional boards. And uh, as you can see, I have only one board in this machine, but this is the board for the high resolution graphics. As far as I know, the plug-in boards that were available is a high resolution card, a serial port card, uh, or actually two serial port cards, and two parallel port cards here. So that you could use this machine to control some relays or a printer or whatever. But my machine here it just comes with a high resolution card, which is also the most important, I guess. Because then you can take measurements from the vector network analyzer and uh, you can draw Smith charts and stuff like that uh, directly on the CRT monitor. We'll take a look at the high resolution graphics card in a, in a little bit. But on the daughter card here, we basically have some 
EEPROMs with software and uh, there's a spare socket here as well. Apart from that there's some control logic and the big chip up here is a Western Digital 1771 floppy controller chip. And as I said earlier this chip can control single density single sided uh, floppy drives so it's really an old chip. And as you can see there's a, there's a little trimmer up here and this is for the face lock loop inside here. Because the data that comes out from the floppy drive is a serial bit stream and uh, it doesn't come with a clock. So based on that uh, the floppy drive chip has to extract the clock from the actual data. And besides from that there are some uh, TTL driver chips and uh, I think this little green one is a clock oscillator. Because there's only four pins on it, so it is very unlikely that it is a battery back memory. And that's it for the daughter card really. There's a lot of logic, there's a floppy drive controller and there are some EEPROMs with the software for running the floppy drive. Okay, and here we have the PUC option B6, which is the graphics card. It is very interesting actually, because it does not con consist of any graphics controller chip whatsoever. So basically the way it works is that the puck has a video generating circuit on the main board. But it doesn't have a lot of RAM. In fact it has only uh, 2 kilobyte of RAM. And each byte of memory in this RAM corresponds to one character on the screen. So one byte could be for instance an A or B or C or a zero or a full stop or something like that. And the way it works is that each byte will be sent through an EEPROM that has a bitmap of each of the different letters and characters. And in that way you can have a text display using just one EEPROM and one 2 kilobyte RAM. And uh, that's the cheap way of doing stuff. Because you must remember back in the late 70s RAM is really really expensive. And that is why this video graphics card here, the high resolution card, was an option and not part of the main board. The RAM is down here on a daughter card. If we take a look at the board itself, it has basically uh, a Eurocard connector here with all the data buses and the address buses and some control signals from the main CPU. And when the CPU writes data to the graphics memory, it goes through these uh, 74LS244s and down into the RAM below here. This EEPROM here contains some additional program code that contains the additional commands for the basic interpreter. But anyway, when the CPU is not writing to memory, it's basically running all by itself. And there are a lot of counters here, and this will address the RAM memory underneath, uh, and it will read out the data one byte by one byte, and uh, then they will use the shift register to generate the pixel data uh, that goes to the display. And uh, all the clock timing is done by these TTL gates here. And uh, I'm quite sure this is what happens because there's a lot of flip-flops and there's a lot of shift registers over here. Uh, and a couple of counters and then the bus LS244 buffer here. So uh, yeah, this is pretty clear that that's what's going on. And the graphics uh, data is coming out serially through this cable here, the gray cable at the back and goes to the main board. And that's really it. It's a clever little design. And there's the screen, and uh, I hope you can see it, but there's a Rode und Schwarz logo and it says the Puck Process Controller. And it has 32 kilobytes of user RAM. And it's programmable in BASIC, and uh, it's not a Microsoft BASIC, and it's not a Commodore BASIC. So I guess Rode und Schwarz had made their own BASIC. And of course, why wouldn't they? Uh, they wouldn't know that in another 3 or 4 years the IBM PC would become standard. Now the floppy drive is not CPM compatible and it's not DOS compatible. And they have all the commands in the ROM for controlling the floppy drive. Except for the floppy format command and the floppy directory command. So without a so called mother disk it's impossible to use the floppy drives. So I can't save anything. But I can make a little program, the standard one, the hello world, just to show you that everything is working. One, zero, print. Yeah, that looks nice. And if we run that, R U N, run, and there's my hello world. So anyway, yeah, that's it. Now I have everything, and I can uh, continue with my GPIB bus design, and that will be coming up shortly in another video.
So yeah, thank you for watching and uh, see you again soon.